Hi, this is Justin from the Medical Nutritionist Podcast. Uh, today, I've got Keegan Smith on from Real Movement. Uh, Keegan, thanks for joining. Thanks for having me, Justin. Um, Real Movement is a very unique organization. And before the podcast, I was trying to think what exactly is the best way to describe it? Because I've never come across something that is quite exactly like it. What, what is the best way to describe Real Movement? Well, if I'm speaking to a border official, I just say it's uh, personal trainer education. <laughs> Fair enough. But if you're but speaking to uh, yeah, it's different things to different people, I think, Justin. And it, there is a little bit of a challenge within that. I mean, we, we do try to provide a service that works. And to do that, you know, we have to go beyond, I guess, traditional education of, of just trying to download information into people's heads. We, we really um, try to offer all components of what might be required to help people get the results they want. So there's, there's components of business education and personal development and, you know, the movement training system itself uh, is, is broader and more inclusive of other ideas than, than a lot of the other, you know, kind of education things that are out there. So it's, it's a little bit non-traditional in a lot of ways, I guess. Mm, definitely. Uh, it's a question that I asked uh, Rowan, your brother, who was previously on the podcast as well, as saying that you know, one of the struggles that I have when working with uh, clients is that you're, you know what you need to tell them to do. If they followed exactly what you told them to do, they would get to the stages of way where they would get to. Do you find it easier when coaching coaches or coaching trainers because they have a different mindset or is it the same, same kind of struggles you face with, with teams or with, with clients as well? I, th I, think, I think coaches have the same challenges. You know, if I'm honest, uh, I, I would say I feel like, you know, I have the same challenges. If it's a new behavior that I'm trying to introduce into my life, then it's not always going to be smooth sailing just because... I, I've coached other people and, you know, athletes have had good results and things that I've worked with, but it doesn't mean that I'm not going to have battles against uh, my own habits and things that pop up in my life. And, you know, what my, if it's, if we're talking about nutrition, then what my wife's eating or what my kids are eating or, you know, going out to dinner or, you know, like the, this, the same challenges are there to sometimes slip away from what I do uh, want to do and slip away from the plan, uh, you know, I'd say I, on average, I tend to be a bit more disciplined than, than most people, but because I've in, in those areas, because I've exercised those you know, muscles and built those habits, uh, I don't have a temptation to grab a pizza or eat some McDonald's or something like that, because it's been quite a long time since I've done those things, you know, but um, I, th I think we experience the same challenges. I think coaches, in a lot of ways, it can be more challenging for coaches because we put the expectation on ourselves that we, we should already be doing everything perfectly and, and kind of being vulnerable, vulnerable enough to say, I actually need, you know, I need some help. I need some support around me. I need to be challenged to get the best out of myself. Like just because I'm a coach doesn't mean I'm going to coach myself well without any of the kind of, you know, support that, you know, you believe in support and supporting others to a pro like through a process and, and like mm -hmm. mentoring and apprenticeships and these things go way back in history. Like we know that those processes are important and they work. So why wouldn't you have one? You know, why wouldn't you engage in that process for yourself? Like that's, I guess the, the theory of it. And, you know, I continue to look for mentors and look for, for coaches and people that inspire me and, you know, that can happen in different structures. It can be formal and paid, or it can just be a, you know, a friendship and a relationship that builds and, you know, they've, they come in all different shapes and sizes, but I think if coaches aren't looking for those things and engaging with, with those processes, then uh, it's easy for, for, for life to fall off, off track or just not to progress at the rate that we'd like to. I think, I think we, we're not so immune to that because we're coaches. Definitely. Yeah. And we may be very disciplined or, or know how to perform or to apply things in certain areas of our life. Nutritionally, yeah. it's easy for us, for example, to then sometimes say like, I'm not going to eat that. I, there might be a physical yeah. at home, but it's, it's very easy for me to say, nah, it's fine. I'm, I have no issue with that. Or I need to train. I don't feel like it, but I will train that day, which just, it's hard to understand for someone who doesn't have that mentality, but may have discipline in a lot of other areas of their life, or maybe better, for example, yeah. in business or, or in other areas as well. 100%. 100%. We're all tough at something. I think Edo Portal said, you know, we're, we're all tough at something, but no one's tough at everything. I think the mm -hmm. same goes for, for this area. You know, we're all smart or disciplined at something, but we're not smart or disciplined at everything. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I, this is one of the things I really like about Real Movement as an organization as well, is that one of the things you mentioned from the very, very beginning is saying that to lead from the front, to lead by example as well. 
to say, you know, if I achieve a certain body fat percentage or if I achieve a certain strength level or, or, or all of these different things. And of course, you can't be the best within every single area as the leader of real movement. And you have different people who are, say, for example, an expert at one arm chin ups or an expert on a range of flexibility and these kind of things. But to still to aim for that and to still achieve above average results, yeah, if you don't have that and you're just telling people what to do, it's very hard. And it's very hard to take goals and advice from people who are not in shape. When I go to the gym and if I see someone, a personal trainer who is out of shape, I don't understand why someone would go and get personal training advice from someone who isn't in shape themselves. So people, I think people generally want someone who's one step ahead of them, Justin. So you might not be the person that the majority of society actually wants to work with because the majority of society are heavily overweight or massively out of shape. And it can be intimidating. If you think about it for yourself, like if we took another area, would you feel comfortable going to a billionaire for business advice, you know, yeah. and, or investing advice and then go, look, well, you know, we'll put a million dollars here. We'll put a million dollars there. And you go, oh, I'm sorry, but uh, that might be a little bit, you know, might take me a little while to get there. Or well, they yeah. talk about, you know, how to run a hundred staff and you'd be like, yeah, um, uh, that's not me just yet. So like, I think the same thing happens um, in, in training where the most advanced coaches may, may not be able to associate, may not be able to, to uh, interact. And a skilled coach can and, and will be able to adapt. And at certain points, you know, someone may be ready for a complete overhaul where an advanced coach is, is really what they're after, regardless of their position. You know, they may have just been told. A lot of times it's when they get a diagnosis of something, right? A label is applied and then, mm. you know, someone hits the panic button and they're like, yeah, okay, I'm ready to change now. And they may well go and search out, you know, seek the the highest qualified coach that they can find who's really going to make a, a change. But for a lot of times I think people are just looking for that person one step ahead of them. So there, I think there is a, a place and a role for, for lots of you know coaches at different levels with, with different objectives for the people that they work with. Uh, for myself, you know, I, I do, I love physicality and, and training and, and I have since I was a little kid, I, I remember my dad had a, a couple of, you know, maybe one kilo little dumbbells uh, that I used to play with when I was like eight years old. And I was just, I've been fascinated by, strength and muscle and training um since since i was young and i don't consider myself to be gifted towards the these areas you know it was a long journey for me to put the the big wheels on the bar for, for bench press and i'm talking about pressing 60 kilos you know and it, yeah. and it was a big journey after that to get to 100 where i know other people at that same age um, especially in the rugby field you know they'll they'll bench 100 on their first day you know what i mean like that's you, you see those those kinds of people as well so i wouldn't say I'm, you know, massively talented or naturally the area of strength for me. But because of that, you know, going through the journey, because of, you know, learning handstands after 30 and learning um, a lot of these things, you know, later I, I do have um, some understanding or connection of what it feels like to be an adult learner in, in these things. And I think there's some advantage in that. Um, I'm not, you know, I'm not the strongest guy. I'm not the most advanced guy in a lot of areas. Um, what I do have is that I have been through those processes and I'm very committed to seeing coaches succeed. So there are guys out there who are much stronger than me and, and potentially have better methods in, in training. But then you have to look at what are the results of the people that they're, you know, maybe they've had amazing results with, with helping coaches to another level, or maybe they haven't, you know, maybe they're, maybe they're that billionaire and, and they don't relate to certain people or, or maybe they're not, you know, like it's, um, and yeah. In a way, I, to be honest, that's a really good point. And I, I do think that in a way is much more of a strength. If, do you want to listen to, say, for example, you want to add muscle. If do you want to listen to someone who's struggled their whole life to gain muscle because of genetic reasons, but they still manage a pretty significant amount of muscle, or do you want to listen to someone who's like, you just lift up a weight and you'll gain muscle because they just genetically very easily put that on. And uh, I put our podcast today, um, well, actually, I'm recording this now. This one will be in a few weeks' time. Uh, but it was basically about the fact that well, it, uh, me growing up, I had a few uh, autoimmune disorders, some genetic things that affect me. And I can go, oh, poor me, because I have that. But actually, because of that, that drove me to figure out all the different steps that could help myself or could help other people with these kind of issues as well. And in a way, that's kind of taking your, your weakness and turning it into a strength. I think that's huge. It definitely helps a lot of people. 100%. 
hundred percent. That's, you know, I, I've had health challenges that I've you know spoken about quite a bit as well. And I think that makes you more relatable. I actually, there was a, a guy who was, was quite big and quite well, um, you know, versed in nutrition, those sorts of things. And I told him that I'd had issues with irritable bowel and he just laughed in my face, like, as if like, that's a disease of old people. And, you know, I don't know what to do kind of thing. Like it was, it was like mocking because I'd had trouble putting on weight because when I would eat the diets that were suggested to put on weight, my, my digestive system couldn't handle those foods. And I would, you know, I'd get sick, I'd get bloated and I couldn't eat anymore. Um, because yeah, I was, my digestive system just didn't deal with those food choices that everyone was saying, like, these are the foods to put on weight. So it wasn't until I got away from those foods that, you know, putting on weight became much easier. And, um, yeah, I can uh, empathize with those people who are, you know, hard gainers or, uh, it's, it's, yeah, a lot of, a lot of times the solution is just to eat more, but it's, if you're having food allergies to those foods, if you, if you, you know, I had, uh, like hay fever, you know, and it was related to gut issues, which it often is. And I, you know, no one was drawing those connections. I was getting put on the, the medications, the medications were making me feel crappy and drowsy. And, you know, it's a spiral that a lot of people go down and then, you know, there's mainstream, a lot of mainstream advice that will tell you like, there's nothing you can do about that. Or, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's a sad state of affairs. I think uh, Justin, where, you know, when just not, people aren't being exposed to the right ideas and solutions and the consequences of that for guys who want to just, you know, feel fit and strong and then just enjoy their lives. Like it's, it's, it, it is uh, massively life enhancing, at least when you start to solve those problems. So I think it's, it's good work that we, that we get to do. Um, one of the guys I've been working with recently, he wants to play top level rugby, uh, rugby league. He's, he's like 82 kilos. He's taller than me. So it's, it's sort of too light for the position he wants to play. Like he's super athletic, really fast, fullback. Um, but he's, he's just, you know, been following our program and our protocols. And, you know, he, he'd been the same weight for, you know, a year, a year and a bit. He's only like 18, 19. But he's, he's put on, you know, he's, he's weighed 90 kilos what, the other day. He's, he's weighing about 88 most days. Um, so now he's sort of a weight where he, he could really push for a position. And... You know, the sports nutritionist advice just wasn't working, trying to stick to two grams of, you know, protein per kilogram body weight and, and all that stuff. It just, it's, it didn't work. Like he was training hard. He's a good kid, but it, it just, what well, he wasn't putting on mass. And then we used an alternative approach and he put on like six to eight kilos of, of mass. He's, he's running faster than he ever has. His back squat's gone up by 20 kilos. His front squat's, you know, he's back squat of 175, which is, you know, it's not going to break any powerlifting records, but still, yeah. deep. A deep squat, you know, a deep squat to that level, like double body weight. It's, it's uncommon in pro rugby to see someone um, squat to that depth, that quality before 20. You know, like he's, he's put himself in a good position, but it did take an, an approach that would be um, contraindicated by a lot of sports dietitians, etc. Like they would say, you know, so I just, I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of dogma and it's disappointing that, um, a lot of the, the the strongest voices in nutrition and in, in saying things are evidence based and research based and and these sorts of things are it's just it's such a young field and I think mm. uh, a lot of times what they're talking about is just it's just not science it's it's and it doesn't actually work in practice but it's what's there in the research and and the you know a lot of the, the corruption around research itself and who's funding things and and all those things it just it leaves those young kids in a position where they're not getting the support that they need. And, and ultimately that means for a lot, of, a lot of those guys, they just don't get to make it. You know, they don't have the natural genetic potential, so they don't make it. Same as the knees over toes type story where, you know, he wasn't getting the, what he needed for his knees. And, and as a result, like he missed out on a Div 1, you know, college uh, career and, and those sorts of things. And, and like ultimately, you know, for Ben, for those who know knees over toes guy, like he's doing something amazing now. And, and, and I think the, the future is really bright for him, but it's, it's the same thing where just missing out on the right information really um, changes the path in life. So I think it's, it's a valuable thing that um, to do, yeah, explore truth and to share what you, what you see working and what you think is best. Like it's, it's a good path to go down for a career, you know, I'm, I'm really glad that I get to do it. Definitely, and this is something that Ben talked about as well, saying that there's so much misinformation out there. There's a lot of people who are great at marketing and that's where they sell their subpar products or the mainstream advice. And again, 
Charles Poliquin consistently said that if he followed the research, as it were, he would be three or four Olympics behind because he followed off what he found from decades of his own personal research, decades of his own, what in fact was a, a study over thousands of athletes, but just because it wasn't peer reviewed and all the official processes, it wasn't taken seriously in the same vein, but he got the results over consistently over years and years and years. Um, and this is the thing, we do have a bit of a responsibility to say to ourselves, well, we understand what is actually going to get people healthy, what is going to reduce disease, going to get people towards their goals of losing fat or gaining muscle, or even if it's just an aesthetical goal or, or for focusing on, on improving their performance within a sport, we know exactly what they can get them there. And it is ruining people's lives following this mainstream advice that it really is destroying their bodies. You know, if we could say like, this guy wants to put some muscle on the mainstream, if he would Google that, it would be... Uh, what is it? A gallon of milk a day and a pack of donuts, because that gets the calories up and plenty of protein. But that's just going to, you know, he sure he would gain some mass, but a few years down the line, man, he would not be performing in the same way, and it would wreck his mind, wreck the rest of this, you know, body inflammation through the roof, and and uh, tons more injuries and these kind of things. And it's, uh, man, it's it's painful to see what's out there. It really is. Spot on, Justin. And yeah, it's just, it's a spiral, you know, where. They get, get an injury, they get put on anti-inflammatories, they, they get a surgery, and then there's, you know, um, a mental side that goes with that, and they end up having different, you know, it's, a, it's like a spiral where the, the immune system <clears throat> becomes weaker, and then they, you know, they get an infection for this, and they're on antibiotics, and the guts aren't as good, and then the anti-inflammatories cause, you know, uh, intestinal bleeding, which is, you know, common within, you know... So it's it's a it is a slippery slope and a downward spiral. Once the gut's not absorbing nutrients, then you know they're more likely to have those muscle strains or ligament tears, and, and those you know, and then their career can be can be over. And it's just because they followed the advice that they were given. You know, like it's mm. it's uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting time that we're in, and I guess that's where the opportunity is. Where if if you can see that what you're doing isn't really working, then continue to explore and don't accept. Um, information that isn't providing the results that you want. You know, I think that's the biggest thing. I think Poliquin has kept looking for, for truth and, you know, Ben's named his thing athletic truth group. And, you know, I'd like to think that we're, you know, we're seekers of the same where, you know, doesn't mean we're going to arrive to the same conclusions. Doesn't mean we have the absolute truth. It's just a, a process of, of seeking, you know, what's, you know, what don't we know yet? And I, like I, I got put onto a, um, Professor Enderlin was one of uh, Hitler had a had a zoo, and for all the things that he did to humans, he loved his uh, he loved his dog and he loved his, his zoo animals. And he wanted the zoo animals to be well well kept, well looked after. So the the top scientists that he had working on his zoo animals actually developed a lot of uh, cellular technology and understanding of cellular health and lifeblood microscopy and these sorts of technologies back in you know those times that are not, you know, that are more advanced than what's being applied in, in modern medicine to understand actual health and wellness. I think like, if you want to look at health and wellness, one of the best places to look is actually veterinary, veterinary science and you know, experiments, experiments like Pottinger's cats. I'm not sure if you're familiar with uh, oh, Pottinger's cats, but if, if you just think about it logically, like if you had a racehorse and someone gave you racehorse, Cocoa Pops, Coca-Cola, you know, um, before, even without talking about um, meat products, etc. But you'd, you'd think they're crazy, right? Like if you had a pet mm. monkey and you're giving it twisties and, and, you know, Twinkies and whatever, like the, the RSPCA would be called and, and you'd, be, you'd, be, you'd be considered a, a, an idiot. But we, you, we do that to our kids and it's, it's fine. You know, we do that to ourselves and it's fine. Like where obviously with a racehorse, you're going to optimize everything for that horse because there's millions of pounds and millions of dollars on the line. If you can have that horse run at its best for years, right? So if it's at its best on race day, if it's recovering from its, from its track work really, really well. So there's huge amounts of money invested in the health of those animals mm. and that, you know, they're getting they're, all, the, all the vitamins and everything is optimized to make sure that race horse is tipped off. The same incentive isn't there for the everyday, you know, population the same incentive isn't there because if people are fat sick nearly dead then they're, they're going to be consuming the foods that have the best profit margins and they're going to be consuming the medications that are a huge part of our economy if everyone was healthy the economy would collapse like the, yeah. the amount of expenditure that there is on healthcare everyone's screaming for free healthcare what about we just stop using healthcare because we're healthy enough that we don't need it you know um, 
I, I haven't been to the doctor in, you know, 13, 14 years and, and I don't plan to, you know, like that's, mm. that's a better place to be than, and then fighting for free healthcare so that we can eat the, you know, junk slave foods that aren't even meant for us. Um, so I think looking at the, in that world of uh, animal husbandry and, and, you know, and dog breeding and those sorts of things as well, huge money in dog breeding. So mm -hmm. what does the dog need to eat? You know, what, what's going to help that next generation of, of dogs to be healthy enough to be able to reproduce and have strong and viable offspring. And then, you know, why isn't that same uh, logic being applied to humans? But how crazy is that, that in society right now, that if you eat a healthy diet or you live a healthy life, you looked at as if you're crazy. Because if I say I don't eat sugar or I don't eat bread, people go like, yeah, that's like the, the weirdest thing in the world. And it's, you just go like, but it's, if you look at all the research, everything is out there. You can literally go onto the internet and find thousands of, thousands of studies to find exactly the effects that it has on your body. But you tell someone not to eat sugar, like, no, 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 I couldn't live without that. Or no, I like bread too much. And you go like, you do know what it means that you can't go out without something that is non-essential to your life. You know, that's an addiction to something. If that was anything else, if this was alcohol or if this was drugs or anything like that, people go like, well, you should probably stop that. But because I, you know, I went on the carnivore diet for, for a while and I pretty much do carnivore now with some berries and a little bit of dairy on the side as well. But that in itself is seen as extreme. Like, oh, you're just eating meat now? That's crazy. But I'm eating wonderful, good quality, organic, you know, meat. And people go like, oh, no, that's, that's too much. That's, uh, well, it's not even that it's too much, right? It's like, oh, that'll be bad for your health. Like oh, exactly. all that red meat, ooh, uh, watch out. <laughs> and yet all this box stuff that will last on the shelves for, for months and, and, and years that you wouldn't feed to a pet monkey, that you wouldn't, you know, give to your dog if you, if you loved your dog. Like you, you wouldn't even consider that and that we give it to ourselves or we give it to our children and there are reward foods. So you have to look at like, where is this coming from? You know, where, where is this social engineering uh, coming from? Like who's, who's making these decisions. Hmm. And then once you start to look into that history, then you really can't, you can't go back. Like if you understand the history of, of when and how, you know, cereals became health food, um, where <laughs> then, then you, you, you know, you, it's difficult to trust from that point. And you see that that's also connected to the medical system. And it's, it's fact, it's history. Like people haven't done their research. Unfortunately, you know, we don't learn about this stuff in school, but if you have the gift of health issues, then at some stage, you're probably going to go down this rabbit hole and, and go away. Well, like it doesn't work. Like I'm following the sports mm -hmm. nutritionist's advice. My guts aren't working very well. My brain isn't working very well. Um, you know, I've got these skin issues. I've got these allergies. Like that was me at 16, 17, 18 years old. Mm. I was following the, the advice to a T. I was eating a low fat diet. I was eating, you know, lots of carbohydrates because I wanted to go to the Olympics, you know? So I was following mm. the advice. Like uh, we had a sports nutritionist come into the Academy of Sport that I was a part of. I was part of New South Wales Institute of Sport, you know, which is one of the top states in Australia where, you know, if you do well, you get to go to the Olympics. And I was following their advice and then I, you know, I got a lot of injuries. My, my, you know, I had depression and, and issues with my mental health through that time. And um, I mean, part of it was alcohol as well, but that's also part of the programming, you know, like everybody starts to drink heavily around those ages. Like you get the, the freedom to drink when you get to, to 18 and, and everybody does. And, you know, it's constantly advertised through the rugby league and it's what people do to get together. So um, yeah, there's some, some big challenges here. And I do empathize with, you know, people who are locked in that mentality because it's it's very strong you know like the the pleasure programming around you know alcohol and such you get exposed to that from from a very young age where people are talking about you know that's all they're looking forward to is you know, the mm. weekend and their drinks and when you watch the sport you know you see ads for it over and over again and you don't understand what you're being programmed with you're just you know waiting for the sport to come back on but there's a reason there's so much money in that advertising like they're not donations companies aren't donating their money for advertising they're, they're <laughs> investing it you know they they expect a return on investment and and you know they get it so it is a big decision to say hey like let's let's pump the brakes on this let's let's zoom out and just see you know what do we what do we actually want like what what would be a good life what would be a, a good example for for children a good example for other members of society and you know that's what 
we're attempting to offer withdrawal movement. I'm not saying we tell people, you know, never have a piece of cake or yeah. never drink uh, a, a, uh, any alcohol. Like I, I'm not, t that's not part of the methodology or part of the, the messaging is just understand where it comes from, understand how it works and then, you know, make the call like that's, but that's, the that's extreme, really, isn't uh, it? Yeah. yeah. If you can't, you can never have a piece of cake. That's just as bad as, Oh no, if it's there, I have to eat it. That's the thing. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I, th I think it's it's up to each individual to, to make the call, but understand that if you haven't really thought about this, then you're probably just running on autopilot, on default, on, you know, whatever you've been sort of socially engineered or programmed to, to do. And once you actually do some research, question, experience something else, like, you know, you're encouraging people to take take on an experience, take on an experiment. If you're not getting the results that you want, then, then take on an experiment to, to try something else. And... Um, it does come down to having a dream, having a goal, having a vision for yourself. Like if, if you don't have that, then why would you even bother? Like, why would you, why would you want to be healthier? Like, why would you want to have a long life or why would you want to inspire? You know, why would you want to have healthy children, etc.? cetera? If, if you don't have a, a strong vision, then, you know, you're probably going to do what most people are doing and you're going to get the results that most people are getting. So you'd have to start from a, from a rejection of that or from a, a desire for something more. And that's not always the easiest thing to, 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 to find in people. Um, so, you know, that's, that's a big part of the process as well, Justin. I think a lot of coaches miss that, that part, you know, and I guess it's, it's almost cliche now with the start with why, but if, if you're not getting down into like, those sorts of things of what your vision is for yourself and, and where you, where you want to go and, um, and those things, then you may not have the motivation to, to pull away from your social circle or to shop at a different location. It's just easier to keep doing what you've been doing. Like we have momentum in the lives that we've been living. So it's a, it's a big decision to make a change on that. I think that's a huge point as well. Like there's no point looking down on people saying like, oh, we're up here, we're in shape, we're healthy, and they're down there being, no, 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 I completely understand why people are living the way that they are. It's, it's would be weird. What we're doing is weird. What most people who are living a healthy life is weird because we've kind of broken out of this, this shell, this bubble that is indoctrinating people that think that it's absolutely normal to live these lives. And you, you want to go up to someone and shake them and go, you don't understand how good it is outside of this bubble. You don't understand how good it is to feel healthy, to wake up in the morning and have all this energy and all this mental clarity and to be able to, uh, when you do work out the way it just makes your whole body feel and to look in the mirror and go like, damn, I actually like the way I look. I really, man, I'm really happy, like genuinely happy, not a lying or delusional self to say like, I'm happy with me being less good than I could be. You know, it's striving for the best within your life. And it's tough. So there's parts that are not always easy, but when you're going through that process and you see yourself progressing, it's just, it's so good. And that's what I want for other people. It's, it's such a big thing that you want to just say, like, I wish you could make you just for one day experience what it's like <laughs> healthy. So you, when you go back to it, you go, oh, wow, this feels terrible. Now I'm really motivated to get out of it. But they don't know. So, yeah. Yeah. There's a, you don't want to go back. Like, you couldn't pay me to go back to how I was living, you know, at, at those times, you know, eating a lot of pizza and junk food and alcohol. And it's, it's not my preference. People think they're treating themselves because that's how the programming, you know, that's how we're engineered to feel like it's a treat to eat that stuff. But there's no way people don't go back. You know, once you see the truth and once you experience it, then you, that can't be unlearned. So you, you just, you just don't want to, like I, I could, I have the freedom to I have the, you know, the resources to, to eat whatever I want to eat and then live whatever lifestyle I want. And this is the life I choose, you know, like mm. that's, that's the, the powerful position. And I think, yeah, if people can experience it and they can make the decision of, of where they want to, you know, where they want to go for themselves. That's, that's all we can really offer uh, just to, but knowing that it's, I guess, a challenge to make the shift and, you know, just because you haven't been able to make it in the past doesn't mean you can't, you know, make it now if you have the right coaching and you need to improve the environment. Like a supportive environment is massive. You need the right information, you know, you need a role model and, and then you need uh, that really supportive environment around you, right? So, you know, you can be a role model for someone, but, you know, is their partner on board with it? You know, are there, uh, do they have other friends that are, that are interested in this? You know, how can they get themselves in a supportive environment you know, more often and then the information, you know, watching some, some documentaries and, um, you know, reading some books and, and once you sort of read like the history of, you know, what happened to demon with demonizing fat and some of these, uh, 
you know, the, uh, what's the big fat lie or, you know, there's, yeah, there's a lot of different books that people can, you know, Nina, Nina Teicholz, uh, breaks it down, I think as, as well as anyone in, in her book of all the, you know, the, the corruption and payoffs and things that were required to shift everybody from, a you know, to, to, to shift a large part of the population from, you know, a meat and veg based diet to a grain based diet. Like it was a, a, a colossal effort that was, um, you know, there was huge opposition to it, but ultimately, you know, that was the shift that happened. But if you read a book like that, then it's like, uh, it's pretty tough to, to sort of think, oh yeah, okay, the food pyramid's okay. Like they couldn't all be, they couldn't all be wrong, all these doctors and, and dietitians and nutritionists. But I mean, they are, if you look at the health statistics, you know, it's, it's not working. So what's, you know, what are the other alternatives and what are those people saying? You know, what are the people who are doing other things saying about their experiences you know the carnival diet's not going to be televised it's not in mainstream media if it ever do, if it ever does get into anything like mainstream it's it's generally put forward as extreme and and crazy and just like crossfit or anything like anything that actually works it's, it's not going to be in the newspaper where if if health was the priority of of uh, mainstream media or, or the you know the system at large whatever that is then these things will be front page news. You know, there's, there's so many people saying, look, I, I had this chronic condition. I had to take all these, you know, these medications or I suffered through this stuff and, and now I don't have to deal with those things. And if you, you look, there's, there's thousands and thousands and thousands of testimonials of people saying they've had that experience. And yet it's, it's, it's kind of a, a written off as, as quackery and it doesn't reach the mainstream where it, it should be front page of every newspaper until the, the the epidemic of lifestyle disease is over like we don't need to have this epidemic of of diabetes cancer um, cardiovascular disease dementia you know the the big things that are that are killing us at the moment are actually self-inflicted and then at the same time we have this massive health crisis that's changing the world economy uh, when you know the numbers there just don't they're not even a fraction of what we're inflicting on ourselves through uh, poor you know, lifestyle choices but the lifestyle choices have a huge economic positive for, for some people from pharmaceutical and processed food industries. So you know, that's fine. And then we're trying to invent this you know, other industry or support this thing that, you know, someone says they're getting 20 times profits on uh, return on investment, you know, with uh, you know, this, this story with the, with the injections, you know, is that there's a, a 20 times return on investment for, for mass injections. So, I mean, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta look at the, the motives behind things that are going on and then decide what your motives are. Like, do you want to be, you know, do you want to be a part of that or do you want to choose a different path for yourself? And it's, it's not an easy thing to do. It's, it's definitely not a comfortable feeling when you realize that a lot of what's being done around you isn't for your benefit. It isn't for your, for your children's benefit. You know, I have two, two young children and you know, what the, what, what the mainstream would like to have done to them, to have, what, to have them, what, what they should be eating, what they should be watching, uh, you know, the schooling that they, that they should be exposed to, et cetera. Like, um, I'm not on board with that. And it's not necessarily a, an easy thing when you, you know, you choose a different path um, compared to the, to the default. So it does take some, some strength and it's, it's probably uh, not for everyone, but I, I would love to see, different options become more mainstream. I think we're seeing that with, uh, you know, the massive increase in homeschooling and homeschooling may not be the answer, but it, I mean, mainstream schooling, yeah. we kind of know the results that that gets as well. So, you know, we have to explore solutions. Um, that's what's like about. Everything. I, I mean, uh, God, I can't remember who did it. Someone put something up on social media the other day where they said, uh, think of the thought of giving, handing your kids over for eight to 10 hours every single day to a stranger that is just going to talk at them during that period of time, you know, in your mind, if you really think about it, it doesn't seem to make sense. If it's the right stranger, sure. Yeah. If you trust what they know, what they're going to tell them and these kind of things, but every single area of this, and there's a lot of things we touched upon now as well, where people are going to say the word conspiracy, you know, theory, but I mean, fair enough. Okay. That's what you can think, but do your own research, really look into it. Like take the time to, to figure out the real truth for yourself, because this is the thing as well. Like we could be wrong. We fully admit that we're not dogmatic about these things, but we want to see the truth. We want to get the truth out of there. And if you can find something that goes against us, if we should be eating grain all day long, please, by all means, show me, show me that it works. Like go on an all grain diet, put a thousand people on there and show, actually, that's what we've got in society right now. And I'm looking around me and I don't want to look like someone who eats grain all day. I want to look like someone who eats meat all day or eats meat and vegetables or meats and vegetables and some dark berries or these kind of things, you know, and it's, yeah, 
That's it. I, 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 this is a nutrition podcast, so it wouldn't be good if I didn't touch upon it as well. Like, what is the way that you're eating at the moment, and what is your reasons behind it? Like, what is the uh, the current nutrition? Yeah, very, very similar to yourself, Justin. Like, I have, I did, I went on strict carnivore diet in 2017. I saw the Sean Baker podcast with Joe Rogan, and at the time, I was uh, at the Sydney Roosters, so one of the top rugby clubs in Australia. I worked with full time 2013-14. And we had great success there. And going back there as a consultant um, in 2019 or to end of 2018. And uh, I still had some hay fever. So I was speaking to these guys about health and the impact it can have on their performance and encouraging them to not be part of the, the default lifestyle that, you know, a lot of those guys are generally... They're, they're wolverines or cockroaches, as, as I would say, like they'll survive. They'll be the last ones standing in a nuclear holocaust. Like they're, they're, they are those guys that are well put together for the most part. So, you know, but oftentimes they are sort of uh, punching bags for the, you know, for the, for the system. They're, they're on a lot of, you know, they get exposed to a lot of different uh, medical treatments and sports nutrition and, and that can really wreak havoc on their careers. So I was there. I was experiencing um, some hay fever and I was like, I've got to, you know, I've got to do something about this. I was already following like a ketogenic diet and, and it did help. And sometimes that helped, like sort of got rid of it. I thought I'll, I'll give this thing a try. Like Sean Baker, it seems crazy. It actually sounded a little bit disgusting to me when I first thought it, just the social engineering. Um, but I, I thought, oh, let's give this a shot. So I jumped on it uh, from that day. I actually had a four day training camp that started right then and there so uh, in Canberra with uh, 20 co coaches and we trained super hard it was like one of the hardest camps that we've done and it was that was my acclimatization into into carnival which was a bit of a shock to the system but uh yeah I did it for the next six months like super strict and I put on muscle mass I was able to train with a higher volume and my uh, hay fever was was you know completely disappeared and uh, I felt like I was I was onto something you know so since then, I, I focus on that approach. Uh, I'm not 100% dogmatic with it. As similar to yourself, I'll have some berries. Um, I'll have the odd apple. I'll have uh, some dairy, um, little, bits, yeah, little bits of cheese, raw cheese, um, sometimes a little bit of raw milk or yogurt. But I know that if, I, if anything's going wrong with my gut, then I'll go back to that, you know? And so that's, that's pretty much my approach at the moment. I do have, um, I like the beef necks. I'm a big fan of beef necks. Um, sometimes I have a lot of heart and heart, you know, so you can do this quite cheap. Like the beef necks are really cheap here in Australia. Beef heart is, is super cheap. It's like $8 a kilo, so, you know, like four, four pound a kilo or something like this. Delicious as well. You can get Very up with, tasty. with the fat on there. Yeah. Heart can be really, really nice. You can, you know, there's different ways you can cook things and prepare things, but you know, people probably, their stomachs are turning, but ask yourself, why is your stomach turning? You know, like uh, liver, uh, brains, the, the, the lamb brains are absolutely beautiful, you know, together in omelets, you know, they're one of the nicest food foods that you can actually uh, consume. Uh, you know, it's definitely some steaks as well. I'm a big fan of like picanha, the rump cap. Um, mm. It's a grass, grass fed rump cap again, is, is pretty cheap. It's about 10 pound a kilo uh, here in Australia. I don't know what, you know, what your meats are costing there, but um, it doesn't have to be super expensive. And uh, yeah, for a lot of people, for me, it's, it's, it was life changing to know that if, if I have any issue with my gut, it's, it's the ultimate elimination diet. We're only consuming something very similar to yourself. I myself am, am red meat and I have the, the digestive tract that is capable of consuming and digesting red meat. I don't have multiple stomachs. Uh, I'm not meant to be fermenting things. Like if you look at, you know, research the digestive tract of a human and, and there's no way you'll be convinced by arguments to, to be on a, you know, a plant-based diet. It could be a, a short-term thing for a week or for a, you know, in certain situations, but um, you know, we have a digestive system that's designed to, to consume these kinds of foods we are adaptable. We are resilient. We just notice what makes you feel best. I think is is the biggest thing. So yeah, not not too much other than that in the in the diet, um, Justin. Like that's you know some oysters. I don't go nuts on seafood. I don't tend to feel amazing with fish. I will have a little bit of chicken. Um, have some lamb, um, but yeah, I I you know we have a lot of uh, like slow cooked stuff and off the bone so getting a fair bit of the glycine and and uh, you know broth and those sorts of things so glycine is a really commonly um, depleted or, or low amino acid which has a key detoxification role um, some people have said that the 21st century is the survival of the best detoxifiers so you want to have those detoxifying amino acids 
um, in the in the bloodstream. So, yeah, that's that's sort of the, the foundation of my nutrition uh, at the moment. Uh, a lot of fat. You know, if you're going to take carbohydrate down, then you need to be burning fat. If you just try and run purely on amino acids and on protein, and I have had this experience as well. When you eat a lot of lean meat, you do get very lean, which is cool if you want to look lean for photos or whatever. Um, probably not the most healthy thing, probably part of the social engineering to like convince everyone that needs to be lean, especially females to, to not be fertile and to be, you know, too lean to have their uh, menstruation, et cetera, is, is a, is a controversial topic, but one worth exploring for, for, for females, especially. And um, you know, the war on, on children and fertility is, is worth uh, examining as well. But it's a whole other, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a whole other rabbit hole, but the, the fats are important. So you have to look for some, some fatty meats. So whether you're getting some suet, uh, whether, you, whether you're getting fatty cuts of meat, but yeah, you don't, generally I still do go for grass fed. I don't think it's make or break, but um, going for grass fed as much as possible is a good thing. And um, yeah, some, some bone marrow, that's, that's pretty much covers the, 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 the basis of it. Some people do just the, the muscle meats and, and they're fine. You know, you'll hear Sean Baker, Dr. Sean Baker, who you know, got struck off because he was teaching people to use nutrition to avoid uh, hip replacements and, and um, orthopedic surgeries. If, if you listen back to that podcast that I'm talking about with Joe Rogan and Sean mm -hmm. Baker, you know, he, he, he got a lot of trouble from the medical board because he decided to stop. Um, he, he, he dedicated one day a week to teaching nutrition instead of, you know, chopping people's you know, joints up and bodies apart to, to be able to replace joints. And, and it was found that, you know, some of those arthritic pains and, and things could be reversed uh, as soon as the, the diet was, was changed. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a lot to unpack with, with all this, but that's basically what it comes down to eating. And, and a lot of times people will find that they really do enjoy some of those foods, like things like bone marrow might sound yuck, but it's absolutely amazing. And, you know, that's where, you know, that's where a lot of our immune immune system actually, you know, lies and the ability to, to fight cancer and those things, you know, leukemia patients will get bone marrow transfers. They're getting bone marrow transfers for a reason. Like there's, there's something good in, in the bone marrow. Otherwise they wouldn't be doing bone marrow transfers. Right. So um, yeah, that's pretty much my food at the moment. Listen to this. I just think I really hope that in 50 years time, people look back on this and go, these are two guys talking about, yeah, and this is this really controversial diet where we actually eat the way that we've eaten for thousands of years before and we cut out all this processed food. It's just, it, it just makes sense. Like logically it just makes sense. And it's why, why it's so controversial. I have no idea because, but it is. And if we talk about this way, as you said, it seems this crazy thing, but we talked about this, you know, 200 years ago, we talked about, Oh yeah, I'm eating meat and bone marrow and some berries. People go like, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. That's the way we eat of it. Now it's, it's actually all the, all that was there, you know, it would take like almost a week to make, they make, they did make some bread here and indigenous, indigenous Australians would make some bread, but it would take like a week to make, they would have to run the, the grains in the, in the river for multiple days to kind of wash them off and then, you know, ferment it for, for multiple days. And, and then they would have a little piece of hard bread, you know, these were survival foods or famine foods, mm -hmm. but there was plenty of plentiful uh, wildlife on the landscape. The landscape was sculpted for them to be able to, to hunt at will and, you know, do, do your research. Like what, what was the, what were those traditional diets? Like what, what did the early explorers say when they saw the indigenous populations, you know, look at the work, the work of Dr. Weston A. Price, you know, yeah. he went and traveled the world in the 1930s because he wanted to understand why all these indigenous populations had beautiful straight teeth and, and strong bone structures and, and positive dispositions. And he, he wanted to know what was, why were they like that? when people in, in uh, Europe were having teeth extracted left, right, and center, black teeth, teeth pointing all over the mouth. He was a dentist and he wanted to know the truth. So he went and explored that truth and he photographed exactly what was going on. And the great thing about that time, Justin, was you could get a very black and white thing. It's, it's difficult for the modern human to work it out because someone might be having a good meal once a week or, you know, a couple of times a week they have meat and veg and then other times they're having, you know, they're having a lot of junk and it's, it's kind of mixed up of like what's actually going on here where this was pure, clear, controlled case studies. This community is in isolation and they eat the traditional diet. This community is 50 kilometers down the road. It's next to a port and they're getting exposed to, to flour, to sugar, to alcohol. So these children are growing up in one way and these children are growing up in another way. Or sometimes it was literally like they lived in the village until, 
uh, while their first two children were born and then they moved into that environment or that environment moved to them. They were put into a missionary or something. And then the next two children were born and then they moved back and the last child was born. And it's like two children that are born with, with an excellent bone structure, two children that were born deformed and then a child that was born with great bone structure again. Like these photos and, and this photographic evidence is literally there. And you can see these accounts over and over again. Captain Cook who came to Australia, controversial figure, the reports that these people wrote were like these people in robust health, like the, the, the health and resilience and, you know, stories of Eskimos running, you know, 50 miles in the snow together with their dog sleds and all these stories of like a massive, you know, human endurance and vitality. And, you know, what's happened to these people? Well, they've been domesticated. They've been brought into a zoo. They've been brought into um, the, the modern uh, in, environment of, of uh, you know, processed food and the consequences are, are clear to see the consequences for health. So once you look at that history, once you look at that reality, then it's, it's not possible to look at current health and, you know, government guidelines or you know media guidelines dogma around health messaging around health you cannot look at it the same way because that research like they were in medical that research was in medical textbooks right like that was mainstream medical like if you want to help people be healthy you need to understand this and so he was look he was talking about vitamin d he was talking about vitamin x which turns out to be vitamin k2 and where where is the where is the information about this right now you need to get your vitamin D. We know that it has such a huge you know, role in, in health and, and then we're being told to, to stay inside when vitamin D is going to be produced mostly from being in the sun, but you have to have the right stuff in the bloodstream already. You have to have the cholesterol. You have to have the fat that's been demonized for so long. If that's not in the bloodstream, then you're not going to produce vitamin D in the way that you should. And so the immune system is not going to be in the position that it should be. And then, you know, you see uh, uh, the Canadian Diet Dietetics Association putting up a post saying there is nothing that you can do to improve your, your, your immune system with nutrition. And that's, that's a criminal act. You know, those, yeah. those people, like that, that's really, uh, how, how, how could you make the case that nutrition is not going to influence the immune system? And they're talking about it in relation to one specific virus. But the immune system is going to influence how the body responds to every virus. We know that, you know, 99% of people that die with the, the flu have already co comorbidities, you know, and that's the same situation that's going on at the moment. So to say that, you know, your blood sugar level isn't going to influence this, we know the blood sugar influence. There's, there's a lot of articles saying that people with blood sugar, you know, uh, related conditions and, and diabetics, type 2 diabetics, etc., are at huge risk of uh, infection. And we, we know that diabetics mm -hmm. ulcers and, and all this effort that goes into cleaning the, you know, the wounds of, of diabetics. And I, I've seen people with multiple limb amputations from diabetes, like, and it's going on over and over. Yeah. You know, a friend of mine's father had, had the, the, his legs taken off, you know, and they, they would carry him around and he would like, that doesn't need to happen. That's just misinformation. Mm -hmm. and, and yet we're being told that, no, you can't influence the immune system with, with nutrition like that, 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 how can we hear that and not fit, not feel as though, Hey, some, something's not right here. <laughs> like mm. you don't have to have a PhD. You don't have to be uh, a miracle worker to, uh, to know that that something's not right when that messaging mm. is coming out. So I think that's a really um, good message. And this is the thing people have a choice. Do they want to be a domesticated pet that gets fattened up and lied to and living in this little bubble? Or they want to run free for 50 kilometers to be this, you know, this wild wolf or whatever you want to use the metaphor for, because that is possible. And I'm pretty sure that animal feels way more fulfilled, a way happier within their lives as well. Um, I, I think I, this has been really good. Really appreciate your time today. Uh, where can people find you on social media? Where, what's the best way for people to, to reach you? Uh, yeah, I'm probably most present on Instagram. That's the place where, uh, connect with most uh, like-minded people uh, my instagram is keegan real k-e-g-a-n-r-e-a-l and then we have the real movement uh, instagram as well which is r-e-a-l underscore mvmt uh, that's probably uh the easiest places and i link to uh anything you know blogs that i'm making or videos etc uh, through there but yeah if you did check this out and you got something out of it if you do go and chase up some of those references drop me a line. It's, it's always good to know that uh, there are people out there sort of thinking and considering other perspectives uh, when it comes to health and performance. Yeah. And anybody who's a coach, or even if you're thinking about becoming a coach, and even if you're not a coach, 
I highly recommend checking out Real Movement University as well, which has, I think it's how much hundreds of hours of content on there, which is cutting edge. Tons of experts, guest speakers that come in there as well. Every single month it's updated. It's a huge community that keeps people accountable as well. So if you are interested in any of this, just simply for your own personal health, or if you want to actually help other people out this as well, I recommend checking that out. Appreciate that, Justin. And I appreciate you uh, being part of the community and, and the support and having me on today. You're doing great work. So thank you. Right, man. Thank you.